Hello, everyone, and welcome to the FinDev Gateway webinar, Investing in Agricultural Finance During COVID-19. My name is Abby Augusta. I'm an editor for FinDev Gateway, and I'm joined by my colleague, Daniel Contreras, who is supporting us on the technical side for this Zoom webinar. Uh, and he's available in the chat if you have any audio or connection issues that he can help you with. Our series of FinDev webinars allow financial inclusion practitioners like you to share lessons and attend online presentations and discussions delivered by the world's leading financial inclusion experts. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to share a couple of notes on logistics. Um, all attendees will have their microphones muted automatically. And so to ask questions during the webinar, please use the chat box, which is usually located on the right-hand side of your Zoom window. We invite you to submit your questions at any time during the webinar, and we will address them in the Q&A session at the end. And to make sure your question is seen by the moderator, uh, make sure that everyone is selected from the drop-down menu when you send in your question. We have over 200 people registered for this webinar, so we may not be able to get to everyone's questions, but we will share the contact information for MCE Social Capital at the end so that you can follow up with them if your question remains unanswered. And finally, the webinar recording and presentation will be available on the FinDev Gateway website after the webinar is finished, and we will also email the webinar recording to all participants. And now I will hand things over to Christina Lukman of MCE Social Capital to introduce today's webinar and our speakers. Thank you so much, Abby. And hello and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're calling in from. And welcome to our webinar titled Investing in Agricultural Finance During COVID-19, again, hosted by FinDev Gateway and moderated by MCE Social Capital. During the next hour, we're going to walk through a case study on access to capital for early stage entrepreneurs in agricultural value chains and the critical and supportive role that impact investors can play in these types of transactions. I am joined by four incredible panelists today. Um, we have Alex Tack, an investment manager from Alterfin, um, Michelle Bickwilder, um, the founder of the Organic Village, referred to for this webinar as TOV Netherlands. Uh, Samir Newa, who's the founder of the Organic Valley uh, Nepal, or referred to as TOV Nepal. And Maria Rorey, portfolio manager at MCE Social Capital. And we're going to get to hear each of their perspectives on financing for early stage SMEs in developing countries throughout this webinar. But before we get started, we wanted to ask participants to do two things. We're hoping that this is an interactive webinar. So to sort of set the tone, if you could do two things, the first is put in the chat where you're calling in from, so geographical location. And the second is respond to the one question poll that is gonna pop up on your screen right now. Danielle's gonna help us with the poll. And um, this is just to get a sense of who is listening in. So you can mention which type of organization best describes your work. And it looks like in the chat, we've got people calling in from the East Coast of the US, some people in Europe, Johannesburg, Tokyo, wow. We have a very global audience today. This is so exciting. And with our poll, we've got majority intermediaries, ecosystem players, impact investors, DFIs, and then some entrepreneurs as well. Very cool. Very excited for this webinar this morning. Um, great. Well, as our moderator, I'm going to start us off with some contextual language and sort of set the stage of the reality of agricultural small and medium enterprises in emerging markets before we begin the panel discussion. And so agricultural small and medium enterprises often provide really essential services to smallholder farmers in developing countries like financing, access to markets, access to inputs, 
um, but they often also face a really acute financing gap. And so this webinar is going to spotlight two impact investors that are seeking to address this gap, as well as a Nepalese social enterprise, which provides smallholder farmers with bundled services of training and technical assistance, as well as financing and access to markets, and really shows an example of how combining financial and non-financial services can help rural households and overall build financial resilience. The impact investors Alterfin and MCE Social Capital will then discuss agricultural SME financing and share really what they've learned about bundled models for smallholder farmers and their contributions to economic recovery, particularly um, as we come out of COVID-19. So my first question is for Samir Newa, and this is to set the stage. Um, can you talk a little bit about what your company, TOV Nepal, does and why did you start this business? Yeah, first of all, uh, namaste everybody. And thank you for um, inviting me in this kind of webinar. It is first time for me also. And I'm really glad to be a part of this meeting. So the Organic Valley, TOV Nepal, was established in 2011 to a uh, uh, vision with support a uh, small land holding farmers of remote Nepal. So remote Nepal means it is uh, geographically very remote. And um, uh, from the development aspects also, we have no electricity, more than 50% of villages where we procure from our products. So it is remote by road, remote by electricity, but still the villages are wonderful. They are so self-sufficient. Of course, we are under the poverty line as a UN says, but I can say that we are only cash poor, not by resources and not by happiness. So to mitigate the cash poor, we have created the business to support them to find the market in the global arena, like a third country markets not only India, mostly we are dependent in Indian markets, Indian local traders. So that's why uh, this idea and mostly organic because geographically we cannot compete in the conventional market due to the very steep uh, hills and the remoteness. We cannot run the big tractors. We cannot bring the big financial institute to support our business. So organic is the way forward for us and indigenous skill which really support to this farming aspects. So we have seen that there is a global market demand and there is a lots of resources lying in our remote areas. So to, to link up these two factors, so we came as a bridge. So we came as a, some ideas to process their organic products, to certify them and to sell to the uh, global market. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. And, and also kind of as a follow-up question, can, can you talk a little bit about, a little bit more about the Nepalese farmers that you work with? And for the benefit of this audience, can you share a little bit more about the realities that, that they face in Nepal? Okay, about 76% uh, of our population live in the villages. So villages means it's uh, not like um, big farms, not like a uh, big houses, not uh, uh, big roads, as I said, we don't have road. Uh, our some villages, we need to walk around one and a half day. Some villages are seven hours. So very closest village also, one hour walking is nothing. Our students, they go to the school and they just said, just nearby our school. And we asked how many minutes you walk? Then they said one hour. <laughs> so to go one hour, to come back one hour, and they have to cross the river, there is no bridge. So this kind of area, but our, um, Farming practices is very, very sustainable. It is an integrated farmer. So uh, farmer means they have a small house. They have uh, five, six people living at the home and uh, one, two buffaloes, one, two cows, eight, nine, 10 goats, five, seven chickens, and 20 of varieties of small uh, um, vegetable farms. So mostly more than 80% they produce by themselves. So and they don't have cash. So they rely for cash from the remittance. So most of the young people, they go to the India and Middle East 
very few are in European or uh, other countries, but uh, more than 80% are in India and Middle East. So most of the money come back from their jobs. So uh, they can fulfill their household things from that kind of money and very few they sell to the local market. That is very, very few. So small land holding means uh, their average land holding capacity is 0 0.5 hectare only, but they do have a forest. So some of their food products come from the forest edible products and they do have rivers. So some uh, food come from the river also. It is just seems like still we are in the very nature, very wild type. That's why also not so much contaminated by COVID yet. Excellent. Thank you so, for sharing. Yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. I feel like it it really paints sort of the reality of the smallholder farmers that you work with. Um, and so thank you so much for that, Samir. My, my next question is for Michelle and sort of switching gears. Uh, Michelle, who is a TOV Netherlands and how did you come to get involved with TOV Nepal and Samir and his work? Right. Uh, thanks, Christina. Thanks for being on board. Um, so the Organic Village in the Netherlands is a company that was set up by uh, a team of former consultants that have a, a track record of working with Dutch companies investing in emerging markets or developing countries or exporting there or importing products from there. And at a certain, let's say five years ago with the team, we decided let's stop working with the Dutch companies, but let's start focusing on the the local SMEs and try to support them. Um, and while doing that, we we decided to focus on uh, SMEs that do agro processing, that uh, have uh, a trend of um, focusing on exporting, um, that want to be that op operate in a sustainable manner, and um, are able to uh, work on traceability of their products that eventually end up in Western markets, Europe or USA, for example. Um, and we started supporting these companies, just like the Organic Valley of Samir, uh, with support for approaching the international markets, um, partnering up with them, uh, supporting their business development in general, and also trying to get them financing for their activities. Um, and so not just financing for buying equipment to meet the standards in these Western markets, but also to uh, find financing for, for working capital, actually to buy raw materials, ginger in this particular case, get it processed and get it exported. Um, and we, uh, our ultimate goal is actually to invest in these local companies as we have the, the vision that uh, the local company should be creating value, um, should process products close to the farmers where the product is coming from, where it is grown. Um, and there you should create jobs. And we believe that with, with modern communication technologies, uh, um, IT in general, and all these, these worldwide logistics, it is possible today for a company like the Organic Valley to, to reach out all the way to US or Europe and, and sell and take entire responsibility for this entire operation without being dependent on traders, uh, international traders that don't really commit to the local situation. And with all respect, they don't have too much respect that their business model doesn't allow to, to uh, also look at the farmer situation. So um, while doing that, we, we link up with the Organic Valley um, since seven years already. Um, and so one of the big needs uh, is financing, not just for the Organic Valley, but for a lot of uh, developing com companies in these type of countries, uh, especially when they're doing agro processing, they need uh, working capital to buy their raw materials. Uh, and it's difficult in most of these countries to get that financing from the local financial sector as the banks um, 
don't like the risks in these type of companies. They prefer to go to the small, you know, the really small companies or to the big companies that serve the domestic market with products uh, are and are run by either wealthy families or, or conglomerates and don't have um, currency risk or export risks. Uh, so also for the organic valley, complicated to find local financing, uh, also finding local investors or personal loans with extremely high interest rates is, is not the way forward. Um, so that there is there's clearly a need in these type of SMEs and there's so plenty. At the same time, we see the trend in uh, Western countries that impact funds pop up all over the place and they get loaded with huge amounts of money. Um, and this money is particularly labeled for impact investment and is, is linked to uh, SDGs, but somehow there's not yet, it will happen, but at this moment, there's not yet a proper connection between these funds in our country, so to say, and the need of the SMEs processing companies in a country like Nepal. Um, and so we had to find a solution somehow um, and in this particular case, uh, we were able to, uh, to cooperate with the Organic Valley in Nepal and MC and Alterfin um, as one of our partners to um, put all our interests together and see where the risks are. And well, uh, Alex and Maria will explain that uh, MC and Alterfin were able to, to reach out and take another step and not just look at the track record of Samir's company, but uh, actually visit there, meet the people. So, and then make a risk assessment based on the persons, the particular business case, the product, the history, uh, and all the opportunities ahead. And we did it. We managed together to, uh, to get a loan for uh, the Organic Valley to buy ginger organic certified from the farmers in Nepal and get the operation running. Excellent. And I'm, I'm happy to, to be able to have a role in that, you know, this entire uh, setup. Absolutely. And we are, um, in the questions that we have for impact investors, we'll dive a little deeper into the structure just so that it's clear for the audience. Um, but to double click on something you said, Michelle, and my next question is back to you, Samir. I'm curious if you can share a little bit about when TOV Nepal needed to raise capital back in 2019, I imagine there were some challenges in approaching local financing sources, right? And so can you talk a little bit about your experience in trying to access financing from maybe local banks in Nepal or private loans and, and what that looked like? Uh, yeah, um, we are uh, exposing the market since 2011 together with uh, TOV Netherlands. And we were participating in BioFARC uh, so many years and we realized that there is a huge demand in the Western market. And definitely the quality of the product is really, really uh, important sector. So to increase the quality, there are lots of things that has to be uh, improved in our part. So we grow pure, but once we harvest, once we do the logistic and once we do the process, then our quality de decreases rather than increase because of our poor infrastructure, uh, poor processing unit, and uh, poor technical human resources. So these are the many, many factors. And in those days, Nepal was facing two big issues. One is a load shedding. We do not have 16 hours electricity entire in the country. So to establish the processing unit was a, it's a, like a people think it's a joke. It is next to impossible. And second is we just emerged from the political revolution. So Maoist insurgency period, people are migrating from village to cities for their lives. So there are huge, um, uh, you know, that uh, how you say, hazard uh, in the process. So in that time, we have come up with the strong idea that we can establish the company, we can establish the industry in the village, and we can produce the quality product and sell to the very suffocated, very high demanded, highly uh, organic market. 
So we did that. And at that time, we had injected some of our equity also, and we brought some local bank finance also, uh, putting our assets collateral. So to be a small, it was not the problem. So where we think we need to be a bigger, because there are lots of farmers around in the villages who really want to produce and who really want to do a job. So to mitigate their demand or their desire, we have to also think a little bigger. So to mm -hmm. think bigger, we need money. Without money, it is not possible. Then we are chasing our local banks and they are very much interested to give finance, but only against the assets collateral. And it is not possible because we do not have that level of assets, even myself also, yeah. So it is not possible. And then my trade partner at that time, since Michelle and Garek, as a TOV Netherlands, we are knocking that door. If you, if you want to sell the product in European market, you have to bring the investment. Either it is equity, either it is working capital. Whatever comes fast, we need that money. We can show you the um, uh, prospective results. So we provided the demands and we provided our capacity of production with people, with inputs, and uh, as I already said that every single Nepali has an indigenous skill of agriculture because we're born for that. And yeah. everybody has land and everybody has an animal. That's why we don't need to rely on the outskirt uh, market to bring the fertilizer. We do have our own. And most of the villages has water because we are a resourceful country. So then only the working capital was the big issues. And we knew that if we do have money, we can produce more. So then, fortunately, we are able to convince TOV Netherlands to invest without collateral in Nepal. And we were able to convince to the buyer also, like we can give you the product, you can pay to the uh, our uh, working capital investor partners. Yeah? Then I really thank to Alex and Maria. I had met them in Amsterdam and then they also convinced, you know, maybe I don't know how they convinced, but <laughs> it was really great, you know, and then uh, Michelle was there always to be a guarantee for us. And then we, we got the um, capital investment, working capital investment in 2019. But that was not big amount, but it was a very good start that, and even in my country, people were so surprised how it possible how the TOV Nepal brought the investment and even we are not in the profit. Yeah. yeah. Only we have a courage that we can make a company in the big profit because we are working with 728 certified farmers and there are other farmers who are in our uh, internal control system. There are about 1700 farmers. So then we established the, um, uh, already we have established the industry so after working capital arrived in Nepal, our purchase capacity increased. So then we brought about 50 young women in our processing unit. So they are supposed to go to the India or Middle East for the work. So they are happy with their family now in their village, inside the village. My, one part is we establish the industry inside the core village surrounding by the forest. Yeah. So when we have come up with this idea, even our people in the cities, they said it is impossible. It is a foolish idea to establish an industry in the village. There is no road, no electricity, no social security. And uh, there are lots of lots of things, you know. But I said, if you convince the villagers, they are our security. And they build the road and the government will send the electricity once we come up with the paperwork and it was happened and we started with the 26 tons of dry ginger now we end up with the 136 tons so you see the jump and yeah. even yeah. i have a ceiling of 200 tons of dry ginger which is value of around 800,000 euros so this year this coming season we brought almost double from uh, MC and Alterfin. And our 
um, sales, uh, our production went also double. Wow. Last year, last year it was um, around 68 tons we delivered to Martin Bauer. This year, already 68 tons delivered, 68 tons in our warehouse, and another eight tons is upcoming. So that means 136 tons we are delivering because Ex of the impact investment. Amazing. So Sounds that like that means, yeah, that means this almost our cost of production is around 68% or something. So 68% money directly goes to the villages, whatever we do the turnover. That's incredible, Samir. Um, and thank you so much for sharing a little bit more context. It sounds like local financing sources are often really reticent about providing loans to um, the smaller SMEs. And then even when you get a little bit bigger, the, what they ask for in terms of collateral is just outrageous, right? Um, and so now we're going to switch gears a little bit and chat with our investors to get the perspective of the capital providers in this equation. Uh, we have Alex from Alterfin and Maria from MCE Social Capital. Um, and these two impact investment firms together invested a total of $370,000 in um, Q4 of 2020. And so my first question is for you, Alex, and as an investor, um, what are some of the general challenges you see in financing agricultural deals? And sort of why, in your opinion, is it so, or why is the, the role of the impact investor so crucial? Thank you, Christina, and good day to, to all. Um, well, obviously there are multiple challenges uh, in this sector, but I believe there are, I mean, we can um, spot a, a couple of, of main ones. There is the lack of collateral, as already mentioned by Samir. So we are often dealing with uh, companies that have rather small balance sheets, uh, low levels of capitalization, and they usually depend on external working capital to, to finance the operation. So lack of collateral is definitely one of the big uh, uh, issues. Another risk or challenge is, is definitely the production risk. So uh, having to deal with a bad harvest often related to climate issues, such as, I mean, excess or shortage of, of, of rainfall. And maybe a third risk driver or, or challenge could be the, the price risk. So we have a big volatility of prices on the commodity markets. And with the risk of either uh, buying raw material from the farmers at a certain price and then eventually ending up selling uh, the produce at a lower price, or the opposite, uh, selling at a certain price with the buyer and thereafter collecting the produce and, 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 and facing higher uh, price levels. So all of these challenges lead to a situation, what we could call the, the missing middle no? on, on financial markets. So between microfinance on the one hand and the commercial banks on the other hand, and we really see that there is a, a big gap let's say for tickets between in the range of $100,000 and half a million, there is really a, a big need, a big uh, demand and uh, yeah, lack of uh, financers willing to, to reach that, that market. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And then I, I know that something that was really important with um, this transaction specifically was the investor collaboration between MCE and Alterfin. Is that correct? That's that's correct. So um, yeah, on this deal, we, we decided to collaborate uh, as impact investors. I think it has been key for a different set of, of reasons. When looking at the, the perspective of the, the lenders, obviously, I mean, we, we were able to collaborate on the due diligence, which in this case was, I mean, yeah, very helpful to reduce costs because I mean, let's be honest, it's still a relatively small transaction. So not only reducing costs of due diligence, but also I, I think increasing the quality of our joint assessment, right? Uh, looking at the case uh, from, from the perspective of two lenders is, is, is obviously always uh, yeah, more interesting. So collaboration on due diligence was key. Another aspect of course is the risk sharing. Now, when we look at the perspective from the client, there is definitely the big advantage of getting more funding as compared to just dealing with, with, with one lender. And uh, second, also the ease of the process. 
they are dealing with two lenders, but eventually there is only one single transaction and that definitely makes uh, yeah, life easier. I think this collaboration has only been possible thanks to the, let's say that the common vision that we both have, MC and Altafin, on, on what we want to achieve. And also the flexibility to streamline our internal processes. And I strongly believe that collaboration amongst lenders is key to better serve our, our clients. And this is even more true in these times of uh, yeah, uncertainty with the pandemic. Now, when we look at the, the slide, there is maybe an also another element which I would like to um, yeah, dig into a bit more is that it has been key to, uh, to operate uh, via TOV Netherlands because at that time, Nepal was a new country for, for Altafin. Um, also, there are certain administrative hurdles uh, for foreign lenders to operate in, in, in Nepal. And so channeling the money via the Netherlands was, was crucial to, to make this transaction a success. Um, we could not only benefit from a year long uh, history uh, relationship between TOV Netherlands and uh, TOV Nepal, but we can also leverage the supporting role from TOV Netherlands uh, for the operations in Nepal. TOV Netherlands um, can help TOV Nepal to increase the commercialization in, in, in Europe and potentially also they, they might enter into the capital structure of, of Nepal. So uh, yeah, going through the Netherlands was, was, was key. And maybe a last element is that there was already an existing track record between MCE, Social Capital and TOV Netherlands, which definitely um, has yeah, uh, brought more comfort. Now, when looking at the um, risk mitigation, as mentioned before by Samir, uh, collateral is definitely a, a problem for these small uh, SMEs. Now, what we as impact investors um, do is that we use export sales contracts uh, to organize the repayments to the lenders. So in this case, the exporter, so TOV Nepal, will ask the buyer, Martin Bauer from Germany, to pay the bill to the lenders instead of to Nepal, and thereby they will pay back the loan. And so this mechanism where eventually we are lenders, exporters, and also the buyers uh, collaborating together is, is definitely uh, yeah, uh, very helpful to yeah, succeed in this kind of transactions. Absolutely. Um, and what is the saying that necessity breeds innovation? So it's really fascinating to see how different um, impact investors have found ways to innovate um, and collaborate to get financing to very much in need early stage agri SMEs. So thank you, Alex. And my next question is for Maria, um, sort of stepping back, what are you seeing on the ground, so to speak? I know we're not, uh, we haven't been traveling for the past year, but I'm closer to the ground with regard to financing agricultural SMEs. And if you can sort of summarize some of the key learnings from doing impact investing with these types of businesses. Absolutely. Um, and maybe one of the things that I would like to add to this question is maybe also in the context of COVID-19, right? Um, so uh, from our experience, MC has been working with small and medium enterprises engaged in agriculture for the past six years. And one of the things that we have always seen, and in a way, this pandemic, COVID-19, exacerbated, is to realize that um, uh, the small and medium enterprises that are solid and well supported at, at all levels, including with the finance, usually remain strong throughout the crisis. So for example, in COVID, we see this as a means, um, the ones that are weak are having their weaknesses exacerbated and the ones that were strong remaining strong. So as we say, internally, the ones coming into the crisis strong, they seem to be going out of it strong. One of the key elements that we have identified is um, uh, as a strength for these small and medium enterprises is how committed um, they are to their farmers networks and vice versa. So how committed are the farmers networks to these uh, small and medium enterprises? And uh, I would like to summarize this in th into th sort of three key elements that make this important. First of all, um, how 
what, so where are the three elements that basically bring strength to the relationship between the SME and the farmer? First of all, um, the SME providing services to farmers beyond the mere business proposal seems to be key. So beyond the fact that the SME might be offering access to better pricing, which is, let's say, the first layer of engagement between a company and a farmer in order for the farmer to, to sell to the company, um, we've seen farmer networks much more committed to companies that have been able to a be loyal to them in the good times and bad times for example paying them timely during or quickly after the harvest uh, moment something else is smes that provide additional services such as technical assistance to for example uh, improve yields uh, or that they provide other services, such as providing input, inputs like seeds or fertilizer, something that you were mentioning uh, also, Christina. And something else also um, that we see are companies that direct profits to improve either the infrastructure of the community uh, or that to, to help making the life of the farmers easier, such as setting up procurement centers, uh, basically for the convenience of the farmer. Those are elements that we see strengthen the relationship between the SME and the farmer um, and the farmer network. Uh, one of the issues that are faced by SMEs is exactly uh, pinpointing that. So the lack of working capital, the lack of enough financing in order to pay farmers on time is one of the key fragilities uh, on that we see on the ground. Uh, that results on farmers basically being much more keen to cite selling, so basically selling their product elsewhere, basically because the, um, the SME is not paying them uh, on time because of lack of financing, not, not because of lack of willingness. So the role of impact investors, like uh, in this case, uh, Altrafin and MCD uh, we took, was to provide financing that basically fits perfectly with the SME needs uh, at the level of the SME seasonality. So what is the crop seasonality that, that they're facing? Um, what is the cash flow? When is the when it becomes extremely important that the financing comes in to in order to manage the cash flow and to make sure that the SME is able to pay smallholder farmers on time. So, uh, so with companies that are able to secure this type of financing, we've also seen how their farmer networks are much more committed to go beyond just the mere business relationship and even support the company, continue selling to them even in hard times uh, like through our crisis. Um, and maybe just one last thing that I would like to mention is that we also see models on the, on the ground, on the field, where agricultural companies are moving even one step further and beyond just the business or the providing technical, short-term technical assistance part, working hand in hand with farmers to promote sustainable practices such as organic-based uh, products and soil fertility projects. So TOV Nepal is among those type of companies. It provides all the necessary assistance for the farmers to be able to ensure that the product is organic certified uh, and that the certification is achieved, um, which on one side, the business side allows the farmers to access a better pricing, but this company also promotes what we call ecosystem protection practices. So basically they promote sustainable cultivation practices in Nepal with the farmers they work with that ensure that future generations will be able to cultivate those same lands, improving yields and at the same time protecting, protecting the environment. So it's really a win-win situation at both social and environmental level. Thank you, Maria. And it does sound like there's a pretty strong or what you're seeing, there's a really strong correlation between um, a good partnership with the company and the farmer and the use of these bundled services and the success of the company. Um, so thank you for sharing those insights. And we have had a couple questions come into the chat um, for Alex. And, and I think also, Maria, you could answer these as well. Um, the most recent is Alex and Maria, if you could share experience of financing um, investment needs of smallholder farmers for processing or long-term investment for growth. Um, and if you could share some experiences around that. 
So yes, I mean, when working with an SME, the needs can are, are, are multiple, but from a finance uh, perspective, you have basically two needs. Uh, one is working capital. So this is money that the company will need to pre-finance the farmers, to buy the production from the farmers during the harvest, uh, to make sure that the farmers effectively deliver the crop to the, the company but also uh, uh, resources to process and eventually uh, export or even sell locally. Uh, and waiting for uh, all of this to eventually materialize in a payment from the buyer. So there is a gap between when the company will need money resources to make it happen and well, when they will uh, eventually get paid from the buyer. And this gap needs to be bridged, and that's where working capital is, 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 is useful or needed. Now, the, there is also a need for uh, capital um, expenditure or investments on more on, on medium or long term. This can be to build a warehouse, to buy another machine or a truck. And that's where uh, investment loans will be needed. And these obviously cannot be paid <laughs> after the, the harvest, but you will need to give a bit more time, a couple of seasons to the to the SME to, to pay back the, the loan. Thank you for that, Alex. Um, and then I just encourage everyone to put questions in the chat if you have any questions that you'd like to ask our panel. I'm going to close out with one more question to Samir and then we'll open up to Q&A with the audience. Um, so Samir, my last question for you is, you know, we understand and I, I know during our prep call, we talked about how this working capital loan from Alterfin and MCE has been really catalytic, you know, not just in keeping the doors open uh, for TOV Nepal, but really enabling a lot of growth in your company over the last year. Um, and I know, you know, earlier in the webinar, you mentioned how much your, uh, the revenue of TOV Nepal has increased, um, even during COVID. And so I'm, I'm curious if you can share about what this means, you know, on the ground in Nepal at the smallholder farmer and employee level with the, the young women that, um, work in the factory where you're doing, um, processing. So what does this mean for the farmers that you work with and the young women that you employ in the production factory? Uh, yeah, uh, it is, um, of course, our business is uh, doubled almost, yeah, because of this COVID situation. And uh, luckily, uh, in our villages, uh, we do not have such a panic situation. But uh, this time, uh, panic situation is a little bit there because the uh, most of the contaminated um, people are entering from the India border and uh, mostly they are coming from Western border. They use the Western border and it is close to our field, but still there is no so hard part there. And uh, due to the COVID, I think um, buyer side, the demand went up because most of the people are sitting home and drinking ginger tea or turmeric tea. Maybe they want to be a more healthy or more uh, to be a strong with their immunization. So, uh, and the, in the villages also, most of the young people, mostly uh, women and men, both they came back from their uh, lost job from India and uh, other countries. Yeah, they were sent by their employer and uh, they all are gathered in the villages now. So you can see lots of young people uh, surrounding in the villages and uh, they were a little bit frustrated. So that frustration is really, really useful for us because they have used that frustration in the field, plugging the ground, you know, cultivating the things, taking out the sweat. So that is very productive. Of course, um, COVID is not good for everybody uh, financially, but I'm just talking about my small venture how agriculture sector is booming in Nepal because of the COVID. Same time, there are lots of terrible parts in the cities, in the lives that is there. But as a business, this kind of uh, organic and the spice-based or herbs-based business is always upcoming. In any kind of um, crisis, food business is always come up 
because everybody needs good food. If there is a more diseases or more contamination things comes, people need really, really healthy things. So that's why we are there. So only one risk is for us is we have to work whole time because other people are staying at home and we are still working in the processing unit, still working in the field. Our young women, they are so happy. Of course, they have a doubt that because government is saying stay at home, stay at home. Yeah, but we are working in the field, we are working in the processing unit, and it is not only for money, it is for that if we produce, then only other people get food. That is the one big uh, part for our is, we should not scare with COVID. We have to be part with that and work hard to give more food, more healthy things for over the world. You know That is our, um, how you say, fascination, our um, uh, strength. Yeah. yeah. And, and a, a question that came in the chat earlier, just while you're, we're you're talking about this, how exactly do the farmers in Nepal get their, you know, small profit um, after, after TOV has been, been paid? Excuse me, I don't get the part. If TOV is unpaid? No, no, no. Once TOV is paid, how do then the farmers, the smallholder farmers get paid? How do they get their profit? Okay, uh, it's like uh, we work in the different modalities. Uh, one is uh, we are really want to give an advance payment for the farmer because it always makes a double impact. When they get the earlier money, so they can invest that money in the purchasing goat or chicken or something. So in the festival time, they can sell that animal products to the local market. So, and in the same time, they will get the fertilizer also. Yeah, but somehow lacking of our working capital also, we are not able to give everybody advance and not sufficient advance, yeah. So that's why working capital is most important that however it comes and whenever we immediately distribute that money to the farmers without any interest, without any things. And we always make sure that they will get the profitable price. And our calculation, for example, in the ginger, uh, the, we give 100% markup on the production side because they deserve that. They take all the risks. So they put all the their skills there. So if the cost of production is uh, 15 cent, our price is 30 cent to the farmers. And they are doing the organic. That's why immediately they will get the 15% premium on top of that. That means the uh, 33 cent is their uh, product cost. So then we provide our all um, uh, technical things and we give them the uh, crop insurance also. And we are always there if the crops goes um, damaged or something, we are part of that. We take responsibilities, yeah. So we cannot pay immediately. There is an insurance, but still, insurance pays 80%. If there is another 20% is loss, we take over that loss and we share this with our buyer also. So Martin Bauer as a very good buyer, they also understand that and they always top on the our price also. So we have a couple of experience. Whenever we are lost in some sector, immediately they increase their purchase price. That is the good part of it. So that's why of course, uh, we are not able to give the very big profit. It will coming up. You know, we are working on hard. If the volume will increase, definitely they will get profit in the immediate product selling. But long term profit is they will become the shareholder after some time. So that's why we have established the industry in the village. Then they can make sure that that is their business and they are the part of the business. They are part of the industry. It is not owned by Samir or uh, his other people. It is owned by everybody. That yeah. is the message I want to give right now also. If the farmers will make the profit, then only the SME will make profit. Then only the finance company will make the profit. So ultimately, we all have to think how to make proper profit to the farmers. Absolutely. Farmers happy, everybody happy. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Samir. And then uh, a question yeah. for our investors, Maria and, and Alex, um, about the collaboration of MCE and Alterfin. Can you each share maybe a lessons learned or a good practice when doing co-investing or collaboration of this type? 
Sure, Alex, shall I start? So, um, Ultrafin came at a very uh, crucial moment for us because um, MCE as an impact investor had already certain uh, relationship with TOV uh, Netherlands. And, but, and we were trying to see how we could invest in Nepal, um, but with uh, placing certain risk mitigations to the, to the entire deal, because obviously there were certain elements that we were, um, we had to, to address. So um, the role of Ultrafin coming in um, and conducting due diligence together basically helped us in, in, in several key elements. The first one, uh, the synergies that we have as funds allowed us to, um, in a way, deep, we could say divide the work and put it all together, working as a one, one single team in terms of um, visiting Nepal, visiting the Netherlands, um, being able to, uh, to talk to the, to the buyer and conducting the entire due diligence process. Um, so what I would say is, uh, and beyond that, of course, then structuring the proposal in a way that we all would see fit and be able to provide a, a, a larger amount, an additional ticket size of the one that MC on its own could, um, could provide and being able to finance uh, TV Nepal with the right amount of money that they needed. Uh, even if small, the first loan was relatively small, um, it was much larger than what MC could do on its own, right? So um, in terms of um, key learnings, um, I would say that finding an impact investor that understands impact the same way as you, it's a major element. Um, it's gonna be very difficult otherwise to sustain uh, the entire um, investment process if you don't see that at the end, of when, especially when you're talking uh, about fragile SMEs, because otherwise eventually one of the two will say, okay, up till here, right? But if you're able to see that at the end of the road, this organization has potential and especially the impact that is creating on the ground and you have the same mentality, then you will find ways to basically structure the deal in a way that, that makes everybody feel comfortable and creates the impact that, that you wanna create uh, at field level, right? So I would say this is one. Um, I don't know, Alex, if you have other learnings, for me, that was one of the key ones. Obviously, yes, the, the shared vision, but I think also really the, the flexibility to streamline our processes because, I mean, often it's it's very easy to, to fall back on, on, on constraints that we, we might have each on, on our own ends. And obviously our process is not the same as the one of MCE, but basically going beyond this, this, these barriers and, and streamline our processes is, has been key to, to make it happen. Uh, again, yeah, collaboration on due diligence, sharing of risk, and maybe a last element which we haven't touched yet is the, the fact that by acting together also, I think we have more leverage towards TOV Netherlands and TOV Nepal and to basically guide them on, on, on the right path. For instance, we, we have been pushing to, to um, take a step forward in the uh, financial audits of the company in the Netherlands, for instance. And I, it's definitely easier if, if the two lenders together, uh, I mean, go with the same message. So I think eventually everybody is, is winning from this and it's, it's definitely something we wanna keep on doing. Absolutely. And a good question came in about interest rate. What was the interest rate on the loan to TOV? And in general, what are what's the range of interest rates that you charge to early stage SMEs? Maria, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, it's important to understand that the interest rates um, need uh, are market rates. So, uh, as impact investors, uh, we are not entities that provide grants or subsidized. Uh, interest rates, we need to be sustainable in order to make our business sustainable and be able to serve other organizations. So um, I do not exactly remember the interest rate uh, of this loan. I assume that it was between 9%. Eight, 8 and 9%. Okay, exactly. So yeah. 9%. So the way that we, we do that, and usually it's between these 8 9% uh, for higher risk 
as a music could go um, higher. So basically it's a risk basis um, pricing. So uh, we try to understand, first of all, what are the market rates? Uh, what are the, um, what is the risk assessment of that company? And then basically play, uh, ensure that the pricing that we are establishing for our financing is something that the, actually the company can cope with. Otherwise it wouldn't make any sense. So those are the three pillars for us to set up the, the basis of our, of our pricing. In dollars, by the way, let's make sure that it's understood this is a pricing in, in a dollar loan. Thank you, Maria. And then just as a, a final question, if Maria and Alex can both share just very high level in general, your investment criteria, um, what you look for in early stage SMEs um, and, and potential investees. Uh, I can maybe kick off. So there is definitely first a, a, an element of, of track record, operational track record, Alterfin, and I believe it's the same for MCE. I mean, we cannot finance a company that has, I mean, just started yesterday, right? I mean, we need to see at least two or three years of, of, of operational track record. Um, there is an, a, a second element would be the scale. Uh, the ticket size of Altafin, we can go as low as 75 or $100,000, but this needs to be um, looked at in uh, relation to the, the turnover over of the company. Altafin or MCE, I mean, we cannot finance 100% of, of, the, of the sales of a company. That would be too risky. So generally, we, we, we have this rule of looking at more or less one maximum one third of the sales. And so if you then look at a ticket size, a minimum loan of about $100,000, this immediately brings you to SMEs that are already selling about three hundred thousand uh, dollars, right? Uh, what else? Obviously, criteria on on governance, on management, uh, and last but not least, the the, the whole uh, relationship that they built with the farmers. Uh, I mean, we do not want to finance any kind of company. We're looking at at at, at cooperatives or SMEs that are. I mean, have really this uh, strong relationship with the farmers, with all the different services that we already discussed uh, previously in this in this webinar. Thank you, Alex and Maria. If you can just share really high level. Absolutely, I'm um, very quickly. Actually, they're very similar to what Alex uh, just mentioned, uh, including the size of the loan. Uh, we are also in this sort of missing middle target where our minimum loan size would be $100,000 up to $500,000 for a working capital loan. And then the same amount for, for a CapEx loan with a maximum exposure then of this sort of 1 million. Um, uh, as per the criteria, uh, just to add for us, um, beyond the two years operations, uh, one of the criteria is potentially if the, if the organization has audited financials or it plans to get the audited financials. So that's uh, something else that is uh, important for us. Um, and that is indeed working directly with uh, the smallholder farmers. It's exactly the same as, as Alex uh, mentioned. And three sectors that basically we touch upon, agriculture uh, with this, this is strong emphasis on processing um, companies, uh, water and sanitation and renewable energy uh, companies. So that's uh, the criteria. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, and we are getting close to the end of the webinar. We're two minutes uh, to the hour. And so I just wanted to take a moment to thank our speakers um, for participating as well as FinDev Gateway for hosting. And then also just take a moment to synthesize some of the kind of interesting points that have come up. Um, the first is the notion that in international impact investors can play a really interesting and an important role in the ecosystem in, in providing flexible financing and patient capital um, to early stage SMEs. And, and um, in the case of, for example, in this transaction, there was a lot of flexibility to fit the needs of the agri SME in terms of seasonality. And um, so I encourage impact investors on the line. Um, there's a really interesting um, sort of hole uh, that we can fill a hole in the, in the financing gap for SMEs. Um, and particularly for those SMEs that are not able to, to access local financing from banks or private lenders. And um, the second is that it's been really interesting to hear from Maria and Alex about 
um, their take on these bundled models for smallholder farmers. Um, so meaning a model that um, brings together several elements. So financial services, um, input support and market access for smallholder farmers. And that there's definitely a correlation with companies that offer these bundled services and um, business success and improved outcomes for farmers. So with that, we just have one, one minute left to the hour. We hope this has been a learning opportunity for all of you. Um, <clears throat> Abby will put my email up on the last slide and please get in touch if you have um, any other questions or would like to chat with any of our webinar participants. Great, thank you very much, Christina, and all the panelists and participants for such an engaging discussion. Now, uh, we'd like to hear from all of you to get your feedback. If you can please take a brief moment to respond to the poll questions, which we're going to put up in the Zoom window now. Um, and just uh, before we close, just wanted to go over what's next. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the recording from this webinar and any presentations will be available on the FINDEV Gateway website after the webinar. Once the recording is available, we'll also send a follow-up email uh, to all of you who have registered for the webinar. So you can please feel free to share this with your network. Um, if you have a question that we didn't have time to answer during today's webinar or want to follow up, feel free to do so. You can contact MCE Social Capital at the email that we put up on the screen. And finally, of course, for more financial inclusion resources, please visit findevgateway.org. Uh, once again, a big thank you to the panelists and to all of you who joined the webinar today for your questions and engagement on the topic. Thank you and have a good day or evening wherever you are. Thanks everyone.